We do have a good show, and I want to start by doing an experiment. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, hard-nosed scientists around here, and the name of the experiment not being totally controlled, or parameters not defined, and it would make it huge. So instead of uh, calling it experiment, let's say, let's, have, let's play it. How's that? Okay? Uh, what I'd like to do, let's see if I can operate this thing. Look at that. Uh, what I want to do is this. I'm going to show you a set of pictures, okay? In fact, nine pictures. And uh, I want you to pick the one that you think is the most beautiful to you, okay? And here's the procedure I want you to follow. I show you three. And then you choose the one that you think is the best, the most beautiful. And then go to the next three and compare the four. And then go to the next three and compare the four. And then come up with the one you have. Okay? Uh, you might not like any of them. Then you could do that. Or you could like more than one. You could do that too. But in the meantime, I want you to look at them and see how... Decide. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, I number so you remember it, okay? Because you're going to vote for the one you like. <laughs> okay, here's one. I'll let you look at it for a little bit. And then let me put the second one. Okay, here's another one. And then uh, here's the third one. Okay? Choose the one you like. If I'm on the way, say it because I want you to have a good look and decide which one you like the best. So I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, next three. Here is one. And here is another one. And here is another one. Now we have seen six. Okay? Seven. Eight. And here is nine. Okay? Nine of them. And you're going to decide which one you like this. And because of that, I'm going to put all of them at once so you can see. All right? Now, let's take a. What I would like you to do is, Helen, could you bring the house light up? Okay. Okay, you can make me dark. Um, now, what I want you to do, I want you to look around. Turn around and look around. I want you to see everybody's hand. Because what I'm going to do, ask them as they vote for the one they want. I number them one, two, three, nine. As the one you like to vote, raise your hand. Easy? Well, it's up to you. Okay? Okay? Now, those who like one, raise your hand. Okay, I want you to look around. Please look around. Because this is, I don't have clicker here, so this is the best you can do. Okay? Look at the hands, okay? Now, those who like number two. Wow, pretty good. All right. That's in fact more people are going for number two. Those who like number three. Ah. Oh. All right. You're getting it. Four. This. Oh. Ah, four is kind of a loser. Okay? So far, but that's what we have. That's the way it goes. Five. Oh, bro, I can see all the signs for the last one. All right. Okay. That's no okay. Six. Pretty good. Pretty even. Seven. Uh, that's as many. All right. Eight. Okay, that one's getting the most for whatever reason. Okay? And nine. Oh, that's the, that's the way. All right. That's pretty good. Very good. Now, let's do the next one. The next part is I want to I give you some of the reasons that you thought it was beautiful. If you fall in that category, raise your hand. Okay? Okay? The idea is, what did you choose to decide it was the most beautiful one for you, all right? So, if you 
I'll put down a set of conditions, and of course, if there's none of those, you can do the same. I'll have that option. So what I like to do, uh, shoot, I see Mike Ryan coming in, so that means we have a chance for the telescope. All right, okay. Now, that's the one of the things that quite often said, is that I connected the motion of it. That's the one common thing, okay? So, uh, those of you who like the number one, raise your hand. Oh, quite a few. You can raise your hand more than once. There's nothing says you can't. Okay? I won't punish you. Okay. Here's the, this one is, I like, and this, normally the blank means I like the color, I like the pattern, I like the way it fits my house, okay? Uh, I, I like the way it goes with the motif of my car, or whatever, okay? One of those reasons, whatever the reason. Those of you who liked it for that reason, you're doing it. Oh, actually, quite a bit. All right. Okay. Now, here's another one. And it is, again, a very uh, typical thing, is that, okay, it reminds me of experiences that I've had. God, I saw that picture, I was in Tahoe, it just looked like that, experiments, things like that. Those who like the third one, raise your hand, please. Wow, cool. Okay, here's another one. This one is the one that normally, I simply go for it, that's it. No, I don't have that reason. Okay? How many of you like that? Oh, yeah, that's the biggest number right now. There we go. All right. Now, let's go to another thing. Now, this one you have to read a little bit more carefully if you don't understand my accent. All right? But the idea is this. You, you are using the same criteria to determine what you like as a beautiful, but you cannot make your mind about one. It could be, like my wife, more than one that you like. Right? Okay, those of you who use the same criteria, and you decide that you'd like more than one with this condition, raise your hand. Okay, cool. Look at that. And now this is the next condition. Get it? What you have, you are using different criteria for each one. You don't have to choose the same criteria. You could have, you love one of them because it, you liked it, you like the other one because uh, it colors were right, you like the other one because it made you feel good. All right? How many of you fall in that category? Why the feel? Okay, very good. Now, how about none of these? <laughs> one. All right. Two. Two. Okay. Now, two people. All right. Now, let's go to the next one. Now I'm going to ask you a second question about the same things you saw. But I'm asking you this time, which one do you think is uh, artistically more beautiful? All right? Now, I put them in front of you so you can remember. And I'm going to count one to nine again. Uh, there, there are only two things answer I want. I'll show you what I mean. Choose one that you think artistically beautiful, okay? Now here's the condition. Here's the question. Those of you who chose the same one as a, how many chose artistically beautiful and beautiful the same way? It was exactly the same one. All right, wow, look at that. How about the one that you chose a different one. Bigger numbers. Wow. All right. The question is, um, why is that? How did you do all this? Why did I do this experiment anyway? Because I cannot see how you raise your hands up and down. Okay? <laughs> now, A couple of things comes out right here. One thing from this experiment, as you saw with the number of hands going so heterogeneously, you can see that, uh, at least for some of you, uh, there is beauty and artistic different beauty and they're different. 
quite a few. If you choose that one, actually you are in good company with people like Emmanuel Kant, because uh, people like him believe the same thing. Yeah. They talk about the absolute beauty and they talk about artistic beauty. They didn't call it artistic, they called it uh, dependent beauty. So absolute beauty was something that you just loved it for it is. Artistic beauty had a concept mind. So that you're probably in that category. You know what? I just remembered one thing right off. I'm going to pause for a second and say, I want to thank my friend way in the back, Michael Fay. Okay? Because he has been he videotaped my first event, he is doing my 26th event. And he's retiring this year. Okay? Thank you, Michael. Okay, back to the story. Now, that was good because that was good. Some people found out. All right? Uh, so, here we have. Now, the second reason that a lot of times people think about is this notion of universality. And here I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, and I want you to be very honest about it, okay? I know there are scientific experiments that have been done on it, so I know what the results should come out, so I know whether you're totally honest or not. <laughs> All right? But, here's the thing, here's the question. When you chose something as beautiful, and somebody else chose something different, you looked around, did you kind of get a little bit indignant thinking that the other guys of us are a cool taste? Their taste is not as good as mine. <laughs> right? Honestly, how many of you thought that your taste was the best? Okay? Quite a few. That's good. At least some of you are honest. All right. Now, the point of it is this, and that is actually the nature of beauty, that we believe that if I think something is beautiful, it is universally beautiful. That is, I believe that everybody thinks it is beautiful. Okay? Uh, again, this is an uh, 18th century idea, my idea, to a manual council idea, that people really think that Beauty has to be universal. And in fact, there was a whole slew of the English and Scottish philosophers who were trying to set the standards of taste. So if you didn't make that standard, you were just a philosopher. Okay? Uh, but that was the, one of the important parts. But this comes out from this experiment right here. This one, we saw it here for sure. What do I mean by that? We saw the beauty is a matter of degree because, first of all, if you looked at it, some of you had to make a choice. Remember I asked you that question? Among the first three, choose the best one and go to the next day. That meant that you decided one of the three was more beautiful and you were comparing it to the other ones. Which meant beauty is a matter of degree. Or at least you think it is. All right? Fair enough, so far? Okay, let's go to the next one. This one is a very important one, and it is very prevalent today, that beauty is a relative concept. It in common, simply say, beauty is the eyes of the whole. Uh, it's kind of a silly statement, but it is there. All right? But the idea is that, I don't have to agree with you if you think something is beautiful. And there's a merit to that. You can talk that. The, the problem of all of these is that we have to determine first what the hell we mean by beauty. Right? At no point we really talk about it. Everybody has their own idea of what beauty is. So that's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to look exactly what is it. Uh, before I go all the paintings that I showed you, I think they're beautiful. They're all from well-known people. The one that got the lowest vote in here was the one, I don't know why, but the lowest vote by, was done by Duchamp. There was the one uh, 
the silhouette of the profile of a man. Uh, but uh, every one of them, from Rembrandt, from Matisse, uh, uh, from uh, Kandinsky, every one of them are beautiful. But also I want to show you these three, because these three are my probably most favorite paintings ever made. Uh, the one on the left is Paul Clay's uh, Yellow Birds. I think it's a just phenomenal painting. Uh, the second one here is the Van Gogh's uh, Starry Night over Rome. And uh, the last one is Cezanne, and still left. And uh, I think those two are one of the three most emotional paintings in my experience. So uh, I recently saw the Starry Night, and uh, I just could not get my eyes off it for the longest time. Now, the question is, what do we mean when we say something is beautiful? If we go back in the history, then we can go all the way to Pythagoras. And I'm going to, by the way, uh, talk about the, from the point of view of the Western philosophy rather than Eastern philosophy. And there is a lot of differences between the Western and Eastern philosophies of what is beautiful. But the basic of it are the same. And so it doesn't change much. And that's where this part of it. Um, Pythagoras believed that actually beauty is based on the harmony and mathematical relation proportions. And the, the story goes that he was actually walking <coughs> someplace uh, at the time, and as he was, he heard the blacksmith trying to pound the sword. So two people were pounding the sword with, uh, with a hammer, with two different hammers. And you notice that when the hammers were the right proportion of the weight, the sound harmonized and was pleasing. But if they were not the right proportion, then it was actually hard to hear. It was dissonant. So he came with the idea that beauty was actually based on proportions. That's what his idea was. Then came Plato. Plato is kind of confused about beauty, okay? Because uh, when you read Plato, those of you who have, you find that in the Hippias Major, for example, Plato talks about um, God, beauty is, uh, Socrates speaks that beauty is too difficult to understand, and he gives up. That's Socrates, and I don't know Socrates. But if you look at the symposium, Plato has the ladder of love and eventually leads to the ideal form of beauty, which is transcendent, that falls into these theories of forms. So, for basically, on one hand, you could say Plato said, well, I don't know what beauty is. On the other hand, you say, well, it's a form. But when you look at the idea of forms, it's more confusing anyway. All right. Now, the next one is Aristotle. Aristotle had, interestingly, three conditions. Order, symmetry, and definiteness. And definiteness really quite often is translated into clarity. Um, but Aristotle also was kind of uh, wishy-washy about beauty. Sometimes in some of his writing, you see that he associates beauty with virtue and with the ethical question. So you cannot really make up your mind. The first person who actually put down a little bit more uh, serious stuff on it was uh, Thomas Aquinas. And uh, he actually talked about wholeness, the completeness or integrity. That was the one thing. And the second thing was proportion. So he's taking the ideas of Pythagoras and incorporating it there. And the uh, third one was the clarity, which really means clarity, but a little bit different, because clarity in Latin means that 
clarity that shines. It is brilliant. It is bright. So, uh, according to Thomas Aquinas, that was the idea of beauty. If something was beautiful, then it had to be those three conditions. Then came uh, Hutchison. Of course, he talked about the unity in variety. I have more to say about that later. And that was his idea of the beauty. And, and uh, finally, was the idea of manual Kant that the beauty is the beauty that interests us in it, but we are disinterested. <laughs> okay, let me tell you what it means. Okay, the idea is this. You are interested in something not because you are interested to do something with it, but you're interested in it for its own sake. That's the idea of disinterested. Uh, a good example of disinterested interest is, for example, is a judge is listening to a case. Okay? If a judge is listening to a case, the judge should be really disinterested in the outcome. He shouldn't be have a personal interest in what happens to the guy. But also, he should have interest in the case so he doesn't fall asleep on the bench. Right? So because he has to do it. So that is the idea of the Now, but <coughs> Those are the kind of old ideas. Now let's start where we are going to be. And here, from this point on, I will uh, entertain a lot of questions at the end. I know that is All right? So, uh, the question is aspects of beauty in the work of art. And I'm going to limit myself for a moment to work of art because uh, that's more difficult to talk about, although. I, I can talk about the beauty in nature too. Um, but, um, and the way to do that is actually to talk about the things that are opposite to beauty. Okay? And this is, by the way, a, a Latin proverb. If you want to understand something well, you should try to understand exactly what this opposite is. So, here I'm going to list you a set of uh, things that. Beauty is not, or is the opposite of beauty. The first one, of course, is ugly. Okay? And everybody kind of thinks, okay, it's just ugly, it's not beautiful. Now, the question is, what is ugly? Well, this is the dictionary idea. Um, if you look at the thesaurus, you find out it says displeasing, unsightly, hideous, I like that. Okay, <laughs> offensive and, and uh, offensive to the senses and etc. And I've seen a lot of ugly things, so that's true. All right, um, but there is another way of looking at it: is that actually ugly is the conflict of order, and I will explain shortly what I mean by that. But it is what it is: is that the things don't go together right, makes it ugly. All right? And that is what makes it to become hideous or unsightly. All right? And now, what is another? Boring, okay? Uh, what the hell is boring? It's kind of interesting to look at. Let's see. Here is the uninteresting, humdrum, drab, tiresome, dull, hideous. Sounds like someone to give you right? <laughs> That's the definition that you find in this effect. Uh, there's another way to look at it. Oh, here. It lacks, the, this is actually what is important, is what makes the problem. Something that's boring, it just it lacks novelty. You know, you're tired. You, you don't see it. And also, it's very predictable. If you reflect on some of the movies that you ever watched, the movies that you know the ending, well, I should say there are some exceptions, like my wife has seen the top one about 30 times. Okay? But that's a different story. But generally, if you watch a movie and you can predict, the first time you're watching a movie and you can very easily predict what's going to happen, that movie is forward. Right? So predictability is a big sign of something. 
people say that, I mean, you hear that, I mean, the, the wife said to her husband, Man, there's nothing interesting about you, I can't predict everything you did. All right? So, boring. Okay? Meaningless. That is another thing that is totally opposite to the beauty. What does that mean? Well, it's nonsensical, pointless, useless, purposeless. Okay? You say things you don't know what the heck it means. Like, if you just, it's there. Um, my son was talking about the students uh, in the class, and uh, he was talking to him about something for about an hour or so about the subject. And then he turns out and said something I don't remember exactly the sentence was. They were talking about, let's say, philosophy. At the end, he says something about are the fried eggs good thing to eat? It had nothing to do with the subject. It was totally meaningless. <laughs> um, so, my son was that. But I think meaningless, this is more important. There are things that there is no, nothing there for you to agree or disagree with. Okay? It doesn't do anything, one way or the other. Okay? It's meaningless. Now, here is more technical way of looking at it. Meaningless means basically there is a lack of order. Remember, ugly was a conflict of order? Meaningless, or that is the lack of order. It is a hodgepodge. It doesn't do anything. Insignificant. Unimportant, trifling, without weight, or importance. We all like to do that, I think. And Basically, is uh, has no import. It doesn't do anything, good or bad. Okay. It makes no contribution to a work of art whatsoever. That's very important. Irrelevant. Okay. Again, the idea here is. It has nothing to do with what we want to do. It's extraneous, okay? For example, if you're looking at a work of art and uh, somebody told you that uh, this work of art was is worth $20,000. Well, it's a very good price, but it has nothing to do with its beauty. See, it's an irrelevant issue, okay? Although some people think that's what makes it beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I saw there was a movie, almost Crown Affair. And somebody was looking at the painting of by my name, the kids, and they were moving around and they were not interested and so on. And the ghost goes and said, Hey kids, look at this painting. It's over a million dollars. <laughs> Everybody suddenly was interested. Now but the most uh, technically, basically, is has nothing to do with the subject matter. And the last one, quiche. This is a hard one to look at. But uh, quiche, a lot of times, means tasteless. It means hacky, gaudy, fresh, common. Okay? But uh, uh, this is the more technical. <laughs> it is. Uh, that's what people call something. It is because uh, what they quite often is exaggerated sentimentality. It is uh, melodrama, and uh, I like that statement. It's shallow, un uncomplicated, appeal to emotions at the expense of reason. And that you find quite often. Uh, this statement by, by Seraphim and uh, uh, Ben Dixon, the Encyclopedia of the Western Culture. Um, so that is what I think the key is. So when you put something that is opposite to all of these, okay, uh, by the way, 
uh, technically is really uh, teach the misuse of beauty. And one place that you see that quite often is in the soap operas. Okay? They know exactly the embrace here, yes, everybody is warm feelings, so every show they have got embrace. Uh, every, every time, uh, I see a lot of times people in the shows like Friends, maybe market, 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 they have somebody sitting by the window, and the rain coming. Everybody knows so cliche, the state. So that's. I have to check my time. It should be okay. And uh, now, before I tell you what I think you did, I want to point out <laughs> four terms. That should not be given. Perception, judgment, preference, and appreciation. You could actually, if I see a car is coming down the street, I perceive it. Okay? Now, I can judge it as, wow, that's a nice car. That's a judgment. Okay? I could prefer that car, okay? Could be, I don't know, I think a Lamborghini maybe. Oh, I prefer it. Okay? Or I could even appreciate the car because it does certain things that other cars don't do. Now, you don't have all of these necessary in one object. You could perceive something, but really not judge it. You could perceive it and judge it, but don't prefer it. And you could do all three and not appreciate it. And in fact, for example, quite often, when people look at the work of somebody like Picasso, the work of, uh, when you people look at the work, uh, definitely you perceive it and judge it very highly, most of what you do at least. And uh, you appreciate the imagination of the artist and the way it is produced, but you don't necessarily prefer to have that, okay? I, I don't think anybody ever wants to make love to one of the women that uh, because of me, but that's a different story. But, now, this is the way to look at what I think about to perceive equality which is the collective antonym to all the ones that we just talked about. In order to be that, it requires judgment. You cannot go antonym to all those six attributes that I call that as opposites of the beauty without a judgment. What do I mean by that? Well, definitely, if you're thinking of something to teach, you're making a judgment. Okay? If you're thinking something is ugly, you have to make a judgment. Okay? Now, you may not make a judgment on one of them, but when you deal with them collectively, you have to make a judgment. Now, this is what I think, actually. I think beauty is the collective antonym to all those six uh, attributes that I'm talking about. And therefore, and now, this is not very popular, but I, I have reason to believe it, that in order to have beauty, you have to have your thoughts engaged. Let me repeat what I'm saying. I wrote it down, I want you to, it, it has to be involved with thinking. If you have an emotion that involves beauty, it has to engage your thoughts. That's important. And in fact, that is, I think, the essence of beauty in art. That's what art does. Art engages you, but provokes your thinking. Okay? That is the important part of it. And, well, there are a lot of things that can uh, engage your emotions and at the same time engage your thoughts. 
But what art does, it just makes it right blend that kills you right on the edge that doesn't let emotion overwhelm the thought and doesn't let your thought kill your emotion. Okay? That is the function. That's what art does. And I think that is the essence of the beauty in art. Now, uh, there are a lot of uh, neurobiological reasons for this, okay? We have a lot of evidence uh, that this is true. Uh, recently, and by recently I mean since mid-1990s to now, but when we started studying uh, neurology more seriously, people have found out that actually you cannot think without emotion. I mean, Aristotle says uh, reason was uh, passion. And that's a bunch of hope. Okay? It can. And actually it shows, with studies after studies show that if the centers that are responsible for emotion are damaged, People cannot reason well. Period. They can. So emotion is always involved with reason. But then I propose that the converse is true in case of art. In case of art, perception of the beauty of art involves thinking. Now there are lots of studies on that too that shows that's the case. There are parts of the brain that gets activated. Uh, that is involved thinking, and for when people have studied the uh, perception of beauty, they found out that actually that's the case. Uh, that emotions are as at the simultaneous speed you have that thinking. That is the key proposition I'm making, and uh, again, there are a lot of studies to back it up. And I think that is one of the major difference between the beautiful and pretty. When we say something is pretty, it appeals to our emotions. When we say something is beautiful, it appeals to our emotion and it appeals to our uh, thoughts. To our Cognitive reasoning. Okay? And that is the important part. So, then beauty definitely involves thinking. And this actually tells you what we talked about, you voted on at the end, and it was through your case. Beauty does come in degrees because the degree of it is determined how much of the thought and emotion mixing do you have in your view. But there's more. Um, how do the artists do this? How do they uh, uh, guard against those bad opposites of beauty? Well, go back to what I said at the very beginning. Unity right by villagers. The unity in variety that they had in mind in the 18th century is entirely different than what we have in mind today. Okay, but variety has different kinds of recent studies, and by recent I mean from 80s to 2010. It shows that definitely elements of beauty is complexity, and this is actually measurable, we can measure it, we have different kinds of complexity in different sets, we can actually assign a number to complexity, all of this can be done easily. And we can even show that how the complexity from one set can transfer to another, so those are not big. It has to have no okay, uh, so and you can kind of think about this like a situation like this. If you are watching a bunch of dots, a red dot, a red dot, a red dot, a red dot, after a while, and then suddenly you get a green dot, okay? That is an obvious. What is happening there? When the set of stimuli are coming to you, put you in a certain mood, a new stimuli which is different from that makes you alert, gives you attention. 
And that is one of the things that makes you really to talk you into the concept of beauty. Now, and surprise goes along the same thing. And uncertainty, that's a kind of tricky one to explain. But it is true. Uh, people watch, for example, a lot of times look at ambiguous figures. I don't know how many of you have looked at it. Uh, dog rabbits, or you watch an old man, young, uh, old woman, and young woman uh, looking, and so on. When you look at ambiguous figures, uh, what gives you the variety is that as soon as your mind settles on one version or another, you feel good. Okay? There are people who have been looking at certain uh, frames of pictures for the longest time, they cannot figure out what it is. But as soon as they figure out and they see the image, they feel good. Okay? That is one of the parts of the variety. Now, in terms of unity, there are, uh, what does that mean? Well, it comes with two things. There's order, and there are two kinds of order. Discursive order is the order that is, you can define a set, you can talk about it. Like a symmetry is a discursive order. Or you can talk about repetition, or you could talk about um, things like proportions. All of those are orders, and they can be well defined. That's one kind of order. And they are externally imposed on a set, mathematically speaking. But there is a static order, and that's different. That's the order of an individual. It's unique to a given piece. It is developed as the piece is developed, and it cannot be transferred from one set to another set. It cannot be defined by any law. It depends on the components that are put together in a work of art, but it is not totally determined by them. In other words, the old idea of that whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. That's the idea of the aesthetic order. So that is what aesthetic order is. And uh, people like uh, uh, Ruth uh, Lauren and so on believe that really, um, Beauty is basically creation of order, aesthetic. Now, um, how about art? Because that's what we're going to talk about. Art. So if we accept that the aesthetic order determines the beauty. Shouldn't art be beauty? What is the stuff? First of all, we should talk about the essence of art and the function of art and purpose of art. Uh, previously, I have talked about the functions of art. I have talked about the purpose of art. So I'm not going to talk about that today. But essence of art is actually the one that I want to look at. Okay? Art is the intentional creation of beauty. Think about it. Let me say it again. Art is the intentional creation of beauty. Now, I'm not talking about only the art that you have uh, in the museum. I'm talking about the art, for example, in the morning you get up and put up your makeup. You choose what socks should go with what um, shoes, or some of them maybe they don't even wear shoes. Okay? Or sometimes some people wear different socks. Never mind. Okay. Uh, uh, so the idea is that to the extent that you incorporate beauty in what you do in every part of your life, you are introducing art to that part of your life. Okay? That is the artistic part of your life because you are doing beauty. Okay. When we produce, of course, when product of art is there, art is working. And uh, this is one thing. Oh, I talked about that already. Now, and now here is the important thing. Even though beauty is essence of art, it 
It is not a function of art. Beauty is the tool of art. Okay? It is what art uses to do its function. That's how it grabs you. So it makes art communicate. It uh, makes things special. It is, uh, makes you express yourself. I mean, for example, like I said, some people put different colors of thoughts every day. They're expressing themselves. Maybe. All right? Or they don't care. Um, and it gives you pleasure and it gives you education. All of those it does, but the tool that it uses to do that is beauty. Because a lot of other things do this kind of thing too. Language communicates. Okay? When you scream, you express yourself. Okay? And definitely, definitely, we have a lot of diagrams that they do education. Okay? Now, a lot of people, that's the last one. A lot of time we use art, it just makes us feel good. If you look at it, you feel good. If you create it, you feel good. Is a tribute. Okay, but not everybody agrees that beauty has to be beauty. Uh, Passmore, for example, uh, thinks that beauty is a phony thing, it's a bourgeoisie, uh, and uh, it's just rich people paying the artists to create it so they can put it in their room. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, Nelson Goodman has an actually different take. He says that, look, definitely, if the ugly is opposite of beauty, and we know there are a lot of good parts that are ugly, therefore beauty has nothing to do with it. Okay? Um, it doesn't have any meaning. Did I misspell any word? No, it didn't. Okay? I just saw it. I thought I misspelled it on the board. Okay? Um, so, uh, um, George Dickey actually has a different point of view. He says, altogether, we should forget about the aesthetic experience of art. Uh, why don't we call art experience art experience? Why? Because the notion of beauty and disinterestedness and all that, they don't make any sense anyway. So, art experience should be art experience. Of course, art is, according to him, is what the art world says. It is. So, that's and Arthur Danto, he says the modern art is a good example that uh, we don't need beauty. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't elaborate on that either, okay? <laughs> but he just says. But actually, I think they're mistaken. Um, what they're doing to begin with, they're confusing the beauty of an object with the beauty of the representation of that object. Big difference. So when you look at it, this is a picture I took from of my neighbor's yard. Okay? When you look at the road, you look at the beauty of the road. You look at the beauty of that object. Rose is makes you feel. But now look at this painting. This is a painting by, this is an etching by Goya. If you look at the cut off head, torso missing, the head, and so on, that's an agonizing object in there. But it's a beautiful painting, a beautiful work of art. Because what he has done in terms of representation, you see, that is what makes the art. Good art where art is disturbed. They do joke you. They do give you a notch and kick you in the pants to get move around. But they do that beautifully. Okay? That's the key to it. So you can see in here, if you look at it, the way this thing has put together, in terms of, uh, I don't want to have it in my house. Remember that has to do with the preference, and quite often people come the preference is appreciation. Even though I appreciate it, I don't prefer it. Alright? 
Now, uh, let me put it uh, for you. That's what we say. Uh, what we appreciate in art is really is uh, what is in the content, but also it's very important how beautifully it is produced. All right. Now, should an art be beautiful? Well, what do you think? Uh, I believe that is the tool of the art. In fact, it is its only tool. Take that tool away, then it's no longer its art. At least that's what I said. But you have to remember what I meant by you. It is the combination of emotion and thought. And in terms of art, it is the beauty of the representation, not the objects. As you can see, you can have a lot of bad art that have pretty big uh, objects inside. So you can have a bad art of a beautiful object. You could have a good art of the beautiful object. You could have a good art of the ugly objects. Now, now I want to get to mine. Okay? Um, let me start with some of my paintings first, and then I'm going to go through this thing, through this uh, slide. <coughs> Helen, uh, now I have these paintings here, and I don't know why I have these, but I just picked them. There are a couple of reasons I picked them. Uh, one of them is that this were the easiest one to reach in my garage. Okay, <laughs> so uh, and also. Uh, well, I, I think they're nice. Uh, also, there's a chronology on it, too. It starts, that is one of my earlier work, uh, where I was really drawn to uh, the unifying science and religion and so on and so forth. So this painting represented uh, the special theory of relativity and Buddhism at the same time. So if you look at the clock, you will see the clock hour changes as you go up, but eventually you get on top, the time doesn't pass it. And you also see the space shrinks as you go down, it gets smaller, which perspectively is correct, but also it shrinks it. And then you would see that you reach the enlightenment, which is the, the, in the levels of Buddhism as you go up. So you have the seven hours or six hours, or whatever it is. I think they go down to 13. Okay, it depends what branch of Buddhism you look at. So that painting represented that. This painting is one of my favorite paintings. In fact, actually, it was a picture that was taken by, uh, by my brother. Uh, and uh, I painted it. Uh, uh, and what I like about it is called light. It looks beautiful uh, throughout, but if you look very carefully, there's a tiny bit of it being pulled by spring. OK? Uh, so I think. There's a, there's a good picture to tell you the agonies of life, which are not really pretty, but the pictures are okay. Now, in this painting, I have music of spheres. Uh, there's an idea that at one point in recent time, we have little by little, we have lost our um, sense of listening to the music of spheres. We have been so bombarded by so much imagery and so on that we no longer can hear the music of the spheres of the uh, celestial bodies. And what I have in this painting is a donkey and a hawk. And there's a poem by Chaucer in which he talks about how donkeys are deaf to the sound of the heart. And that's what is happening. And if you look at it carefully down here, there's a set of demons and trying to drag down engines. And you can see the celestial and the threshold have been separated. So that's the essence of that. And uh, in this one, actually my model is the audience. Okay? That, that one I did it live. I, I, I did it actually with the help of his wife. Okay? Uh, I did that uh, every time 
that uh, I got stuck in something to do because I did that book a different life, not photograph. So I had to steal this shirt. Okay? And uh, I had to get invited to his house several times and to sit to his right because the she provided me with that. And whenever we called to our house, we did the same thing to our quiet sketch thing. So uh, it came out that way. All right? Now, on this side, I have my Simplicio number two. Uh, you saw the eight Simplicios. I've done number nine, but I didn't have a photograph of it. Here you can see the way it flows. Of course, if you pay very close attention, you see the, the staffs of the music bar, right? You see the lines? And so, and you can see how you start with the uh, birth, and then you grow, and you become quiet, and you get into eternity, and you're quiet. And so, that painting, both metaphorically and uh, um, empathetically, represents how our life is. All right? Now, that brings me to what I want to talk about. When I started painting, after about maybe about nine, ten years, I came up with the idea of Simbicia. And the Simbicia that I want to show you tonight, the inception of it was about 13 years ago. And I told my son Dusty, he's an artist lover. And the reason I, at the time it was only nine. But uh, I have always used Dustin as my tape recorder, okay, because he always remembers what I said. Um, so, but I never felt confident enough to do the painting the way I wanted. There were three things that I really liked, and I, I keep thinking about it, will I be able to do it? One was that if you look at the very bottom picture here, this is the luminous painting, this was the response of American art, art to the European and what that, that's Birch, that painting. And they tried to get a lot of luminosity, and they connected that with the spirituality. But regardless of whether you want to be spiritual or not, they were trying to get a luminosity. And the way they did it, they basically used a lot of atmospheric uh, perspective, and also they tried to eliminate any brush stone. So you do get a, that luminosity. Then we look at the Impressionist work, then Impressionists had something different. They, the brush strokes are bold, and that gives the work a lot of energy. And uh, I love that energy in that work. And uh, I was thinking, okay, I really want to combine somehow the, these two techniques together, something that it gives me the luminosity that I want, but also has a lot of energy. The next thing that I was thinking about was that uh, if you look at this painting here, these are the one with the pointillists and uh, or more generally divisions. And what they did, they actually did a bunch of uh, color separations and let the optical uh, synthesis use the picture. And therefore they create a great mood. So I wanted to get the mood from there, I wanted to get the energy from there, get the light from there, and put it together to see what we can come up with. And that was my goal to do. And I worked on it for years, and I did everything else to I get rid of that. Well, when I did the Servicio 10, I had actually, it was a collaborative. My friend, that over there. Um, he was in New Zealand, he took a took thousands of pictures of uh, Oriwa, I think Oriwa, that's the way it's pronounced, Oriwa Bay. And did a lot of pictures of that, in that, lots of pictures. So I looked at the lights uh, and I was looking at the pictures, I really liked the structure of that. I said, well, my Seviso 10, the structure the read is going to be based on the pictures that we'll have taken. And then my grandson was in Hawaii, 
And when he was there, he took another set of pictures of the sunset. So I said, okay, now I need to get the idea of the light from there. So I used that. And then my other son, who looked at it, he suggested the name. So the name of the symbiosis is a variation of what he suggested. So uh, I put that together and tried to put this together to see what I can come up with. And I tried and tried. So this is what I came up with. Is a sublime serenity, is a homage to Van Gogh. And I did that because when I looked at the story, I, I said that painting should be really a homage to him. So I would like to present you with Simvisio number 10. I hope you like it. what I see as a red and what you see as a red are not necessarily the same. 
thing. But uh, we both agree that that is red. So the idea is that what I consider beautiful and what you consider beautiful may not be exactly the same. But what is interesting, what is it, is that we both have appealed to beauty. Nobody is around who says, oh, that's beautiful, but I hate it. So where is the value going? The value between the critics that you decided and your uh, your where is the value going? Uh, at the, in, at the, right now in the modern time, if you look at the art market, uh, there is a prevalent view that art doesn't have to be. But there's a big resurgence of that by the philosophers like uh, uh, Mother Seal, Jamal, and uh, their whole group that they are really, really approaching the field from that view. And there's something else is going to their help, and that is the neurosciences and cognitive sciences are backing them up more and more. And also, evolution is uh, evolutionary biology backs this idea that beauty should be a sense of art. Uh, so uh, I think uh, as the science gets gathered information, I think eventually it's going to be a lot Because the other one is based on the market and the gut feeling. Science is on the other side. There are. Okay. Uh, microphone over here. straight to what you just said. Um, the noted evolutionary psychologist Jeffrey Miller um, postulated that human desire for large sending nervous systems is a large part of our selection for sexual partners. Um, he also postulated that artistic expression roots in the desire to impress the opposite sex. Now, when you were talking about the appreciation and especially that one painting where the artistic, well to me, the, the context of the painting was not something, quote, beautiful, but yet the, the artistic um, painting to me was a, something attractive. And how, how would you see those two? Wonderful good question. I can understand the question. It's kind of a long question. So if I understand properly, you were looking at one of the pictures, and it wasn't really that beautiful. But say again? Well, Jeffrey Miller, who's an yeah. evolutionary psychologist, has postulated that our desire yeah. to pick sexual partners because we're looking for large central nervous systems, large brains. And, okay. and, and, and that artistic expression is a, is a way of, sh like, the peacock's tail idea. Um, I understand the question. Okay. The question is that is this has any kind of evolutionary value? To begin with, it, it doesn't come to Jeff Miller. It goes way before it goes to Darwin. Darwin had two facts: it was the natural selection, and the sexual selection. So, and but the part that, in terms of sexual selection, the things like the uh, tail of the peacock, sour birds, and all those, those or the song of the birds, those are not artists. Although it is true that the choice is important. Now, what makes art art and not the other one is a matter of choice. You see, that, and it, it is true in our society, it is that instinct that has evolved into art. And we still praise that too. I think I have given talks of that before too. What happens is that uh, people, uh, try to select the maze based on their imagination, based their own skills, on, based on what they can provide for them. So it is true that people appreciate art and pay big price for it because the guy who cannot paint, he can say, well, I cannot paint, but I can pay a big price for you to do it. Okay? So that's it goes there. There's a book by Dennis Dutton called Art Instinct. Okay? And that goes into a lot of detail exactly why uh, that's one of the purposes of, of art that I skipped. 
um, and why it has the evolutionary value or purpose. So you think that the fact that we're, we're attracted to larger brains is a way of that's right. That's right. Okay. Oh, it's smart. And yet, I, I don't see anything. There must be some questions somewhere. Nobody go. Where is well, Kathy? Who was opposing? No. Okay. Yeah. There is a question. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Where was this? Where was this? Why is it open back there? Yeah. yeah. Where was this painting? Uh, you didn't right? So. Uh, where were the paintings? Don't they? Most your your masterpiece. Where was it painted? In my garage. No. <laughs> what is the what is where yeah. is the place? No, it's a combination of many places I put together. Uh, part of it comes from the Crystal Spring. Uh, that I have uh, sketched. Part of it comes from the, I told you about the uh, Oruwa, if I'm saying it wrong, feel correct. Uh, Oruwa Bay in uh, New Zealand. Part of it comes from the uh, low tide in Award, and some of it comes from Santa Cruz. Okay? So it's an homage, is everything? I just put something <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>